everybody. If you could make your way to a seat, we will get started with our Easter morning 10 o'clock service. It is great to see uh, so many people for our 10 o'clock service. We had about 90 this morning for our sunrise service outside. So uh, beautiful weather we were blessed with this morning. Probably one of the uh, best weather mornings we've had for a, a sunrise service in quite a while. Um, we would like to welcome you uh, this morning. If it's your first time with us, uh, please grab a visitor's card. It should be in front of one of your seats. Uh, if you'd fill that out and leave that with us um, just so we can get to know you and know your needs that you may have. And uh, we would like to welcome you if you're looking for a church home. Our doors are open to you, um, and uh, we hope you enjoy the service ahead this morning. A couple of uh, announcements, no activities this afternoon. Um, because it is Easter and because it is spring break for the public schools, uh, no equip night this Wednesday night. We'll pick up our normal uh, activities next Sunday uh, with youth group, uh, adventure club, and all of that next Sunday afternoon. Uh, we do have a church work day scheduled for April the 13th. We have several projects that need to be completed, uh, both indoors and outdoors here at the church as we get ready um, to prepare for the uh, construction and the expansion uh, that will be beginning behind me hopefully the uh, next couple of weeks. Again, that'll be April 13th at 8 o'clock if uh, you can make it out for that. And a new Sunday school class starting next week uh, with uh, the group that has been downstairs. It'll be called Growing in Christ. It'll be led by Travis Blankenship and Greg Perrier. Uh, if you're interested in that, there's information in the bulletin um, this morning on how you can sign up for that class. And again, that'll be next Sunday morning beginning at 9 30 we'll be meeting downstairs and a reminder today is the last day for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering we're trying to break that goal of twelve thousand dollars support our missionaries here in North America if you have not uh, yet made a donation we'd ask you if you could do that today um, you can do so through our church center app there's also envelopes on the uh, tithes and offerings box that you can pick up and submit your donation for that as well uh, if you'd please join us we'll begin with prayer and uh, worship the Lord through music Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this absolutely beautiful day, this Resurrection Sunday. We thank you for the reminder of how you died on the cross and came back to life to save each and every one of us. We ask that you be with Pastor Mike as he delivers uh, the message in a little while. Just be with us as we go and spend the afternoon with our family and friends and be with us in the week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us.
start our worship this morning. Amen? Amen. All right, there we go. That's what I like to hear. Before we move any further, I want us to take a time just to quiet, just of prayer in our heads and our minds directly with the Lord. This is a time we can lay down any unrepentant sin that we might have. Anything we just need to lay down at the foot of the cross, we need to take that time and do that before we move any further in our worship so that our hearts will be ready to receive what the Lord has for us. So let us take a few minutes in a time of quiet.
Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Psalm 25, and please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Psalm 25, this is the Psalm of David. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are want only treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the the sake of your goodness, O Lord, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in this way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is this man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hated me. O guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time to be in your house, to worship you on this Resurrection Sunday. Father, thank you for your Son that bore our sins took it all finished it all so that we could just be close to you and love you and worship you Lord Father I ask and pray for your blessing upon every person here every heart that's here I pray that you're drawing every person here near to you and Father we just thank you so much just for the love you give us thanks is not enough We give it all. We give our heart and all to you. And it's still not enough for what you've done. Father, we ask and pray just that you will bless our lives, bless our gifts that we give back to you, our offerings, our tithes, our worship, just our fellowship, our time being with you. Father, draw us closer together as a body. And I pray that you will use us and direct us. And we ask this all in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Up from the grave he arose. With the mighty triumph over his foes, 
He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose, amen. Come on, you can't get excited. You're missing the wrong day to do it. That's the only reason we're here. We are not here for any other reason at all if Jesus is not risen from the grave. We are only here to worship our Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, sister. I preach better like that. Probably preach longer, but I probably preach better too. Well, since they've given me an extra hour, um, well, no, we are so thankful uh, you have chosen to come and be here this morning as we celebrate on this Resurrection Sunday, our risen Savior. And we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke uh, at our sunrise service. We looked at the first 12 verses from Luke chapter 24, and here we're going to go from 13 to 35. And I said earlier this morning, I'll say again, now as Paul Harvey says, we get the rest of the story. So this is uh, the continuation of Resurrection Morning. So just to put the kind of some of the pieces together, if you reflect back on Good Friday, Friday afternoon, uh, Christ had been crucified and his followers had seen Jesus die. They had witnessed the fact that Jesus really died. And because of the, the day, it was the start of the Sabbath. Uh, that afternoon, they did not have the time that was needed to prepare the body. So they had taken the body down uh, rather hastily uh, to place him in Joseph of Amarathea's tomb. So now, uh, Holy Saturday, we don't hear a lot about that, but if you uh, just think theologically of what Jesus was doing as he conquered the enemy, he conquered sin, he conquered death, and now it is Sunday morning, the, the first day of the week, early dawn. Uh, the ladies have gone to prepare the body that has now been laying there since Friday afternoon. But on that glorious, splendid morning, they go and find the tomb is empty. Amen? And as uh, we know, the tomb was not, uh, the stone was not rolled away so that Jesus could come out. The stone was rolled away so that we could see in. And that's a big difference. Jesus didn't need the stone to be rolled away. He was fully God. He could take care of that stone all by himself. So as he conquered death, he came out of the grave. And as the ladies have uh, seen and witnessed the uh, testimony from the angels, they go back and return and tell the disciples and Peter and John, as we, as we look through the entirety of the gospel, are going to run to the empty tomb stoop down and look in. About five years ago, I was in Jerusalem with my son, and we decided to get up really early uh, that one morning, and we wanted to go. It was pitch black, and we ran, at least I ran about uh, you know 20 feet, and then walked briskly uh, the rest of the way to the garden tomb. And can I tell you what I found when I got there? Jesus is not there. The garden tomb is empty because Jesus is alive. And he is alive today where he is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for all those who place their faith and trust in Christ alone. So now as we pick up, um, I'm going to ask again if you are able uh, and you're willing to stand as we read starting in verse 13 of chapter 24 of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, as this Sunday afternoon continues, we are now uh, uh, in the evening time. Uh, Jesus meets these two young men, these two men on the road to Emmaus. Says that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each, with each other about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And as they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. 
and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Father, we thank you for your precious word. That God, your word has the power to cut through, to change our very lives. So Father, we pray this morning by the power of your spirit through the proclamation of the word of God, that God, you will be lifted high and glorified and that we will make much of you and that you will draw all people to yourself this morning, Father as we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. Will you give us ears to hear and our hearts to be open and receptive. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Lee Strobel says that people will die for their religious beliefs if they sincerely believe they're true. But people won't die for their religious beliefs if they know their beliefs are false. While most people can only have faith that their beliefs are true, the disciples were in a position to know without a doubt whether or not Jesus had risen from the dead. They claimed that they saw him, talked with him, and ate with him. If they were not absolutely certain, they wouldn't have allowed themselves to be tortured to death for proclaiming that the resurrection had happened. This great truth, this true historical event occurred the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there is only one place that this truth is found, and that is in God's holy word, in the sacred scriptures that that God has given to us, as God has inspired each of the authors to write down for us so that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt Jesus Christ. Only those who understand God's word can know the truth about salvation and be saved from hell. Only those who know the truth of the Bible can live fulfilled, obedient, blessed, and joyful lives. All matters of salvation and sanctification and all understanding of future glorification is contained in the Word of God. And today as we look through this text, we're going to see that Jesus himself, the the Word made flesh, is going to literally walk through the Bible And share with these two men on the road to Emmaus all that the scriptures point to, which is Christ himself. This has been the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, the Holy Week, as he started early in the week with his triumphal entry. And everyone there shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord. But then he would go and he would read the temple He would challenge the religious leaders. Towards the end of the week, that Thursday, he would have his last supper with his disciples. Telling them what was going to occur. And then as he leaves that supper, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays. And and not only does he pray, but he prays for each one of us. John 17, the, the Lord's Prayer is the prayer in which Jesus called all of you by name. 
All those who would place their faith and hope in Christ alone were prayed for that night in the garden. Do you ever think about that? That that night in the garden with all that was going on, he knew very well what was to occur in the coming, uh, in the coming moments to hours as the Roman guard would come and arrest him as he would be flogged and beaten and mocked and humiliated. He knew he would walk to Calvary to die on a cross, but yet he prayed for you. He is omniscient. He knows all things. He's omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And he, in that moment, prayed for you and I, still concerned about you and I and our salvation that could only be found in Christ Jesus. But as he is here in this passage, it says that very day, that day is Sunday. That's why we gather on Sundays. That's why we worship on Sundays, because that is the day of the week that Christ rose from the grave. And as we read earlier about the early part of that day, now the day has uh, drifted in a little while. And it says on that day he was headed to a village, or these two men are headed to this village, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So they've got a decent walk ahead of them. And they're, while they're walking, this, this guy comes up and starts walking with them. Can you imagine you're just out, you're, you're already contemplating everything that has occurred. You've traveled for Passover week there to Jerusalem, you've seen all the events, and now you're walking back home. To your knowledge, I mean, this is it. Everything's done. The Passover's over, and Jesus, who you had uh, thought he was the one, he was going to be the one who was going to deliver us, he just died. He was crucified. He, he literally died Friday afternoon. And all of a sudden, as they're walking along, Jesus comes up to them. And Jesus, as only Jesus can. you got to love his questions. He obviously knew. But as he walks up on these two men, and he starts to have this conversation with them. And what do they, what do they say? Have you not heard? How can you be the only one in all of Jerusalem, and all the surrounding area? How can you not know what has just occurred over these prior few days? How can you not know all the commotion, all that's occurred? This has been the most significant time in history. Well, Jesus obviously knew very well what had gone on. But the Bible tells us that, that God himself prevented these two men from, from recognizing Jesus Mary Magdalene, too, at first sight, was not able to recognize Jesus. She thought he was a gardener. And then he revealed himself to her. And he, she cried out to him, my Lord. You see, even in this instance, they did not recognize who he was. Further back in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 10, it says that, In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son and to anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Christ had not fully revealed himself to these two men, but he will. They did understand still enough. They say that Jesus was a prophet, mighty and deed and word before God and all people. Interestingly, Isaiah speaks to this back in the uh, Isaiah 53, that beautiful passage that we consider the suffering servant. Notice what Isaiah even says some 1,500 years prior to the crucifixion and the resurrection. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. 
We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus says, Jesus, the, the word of God says here even that Jesus was not one that we should even look at. He had no beauty that we should desire him. These two men did not recognize him. They are telling him what has occurred. But notice what Jesus does. Notice what he tells these two men after they talk about all that has, has occurred, how the chief priests and rulers had delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him, how they had hoped that he was the one, how those that had went to the tomb that morning had been amazed. But notice in verse 27 what Jesus does. This is a tremendous uh, lesson for each of us when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to, to sharing the truth of God's word. What does he do? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What are all the scriptures? The Old Testament. For people who don't feel like Jesus opens the very word of God. Well, he is the word of God, so he didn't have to open. He just opened his mouth and he proclaimed the word of God. But these are the Old Testament scriptures. You know that you can lead people to faith in Christ by walking through the Old Testament? Amen. The Old Testament is just as valid today as it was then. We need the entirety of God's word. That's why we need to be able to open God's word. When we are sharing the gospel, it is so good to have your Bible and having those that you're talking to, to be able to see God's word, to read God's word as you are proclaiming the truth. He opens the Bible. He teaches them from the scriptures. James Montgomery Boyce says that, can God reveal himself to humanity? And to be more specific, can he reveal himself in language? the specifics of which become normative for Christian faith and action. With an inerrant Bible, these things are possible. Without it, theology inevitably enters a wasteland of human speculation. The church, which needs a sure word of God, flounders. Without an inerrant revelation, theology is not only adrift, it is meaningless. Having repudiated its right to speak on the basis of Scripture, it forfeits its right to speak on any other issue as well. We have God's inerrant, infallible, inspired word. And we can have 100% confidence in every word it speaks. Every word. It is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It does not change by culture. It does not change by circumstance. It is God's word. Thus saith the word, thus saith the Lord, is just as true today as it has ever been in the history of the church. God's word is what we must love. We find Christ through the reading of the entire scriptures. All throughout the Old Testament, all that we read points to Christ. We see in 2 Timothy that we are to remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remember them uh, remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. God's word is truth. Charles Spurgeon says that if I did not believe in the infallibility of this book, I would rather be without it. If I am to judge the book, it is no judge of me. 
if I am to sift it and lay this aside and only accept that according to my own judgment, then I have no guidance whatever unless I have conceit enough to trust with my own heart. The new theory denies infallibility of the words of God, but practically imputes it to the judgments of men. At least this is all the infallibility which they can get at. I protest that I will rather risk my soul with a God inspired from heaven than with the differing leaders who arise from the earth at the call of modern thought. If you know anything about Spurgeon, he fought diligently for the word of God as many in the church in London in the mid to late 1800s started to go adrift as they started to move away from God's word as the inerrant, infallible word. But Jesus literally takes the word of God and starting in Genesis you imagine that throughout he, he speaks of all that we have in our precious word. He probably spoke to them about creation and that he in very fact is the one who creates. All things were created by him and through him were all things. Christ Jesus is not a created being. He is creator. And then he shows them probably in Genesis 3 he shares with them the, the first gospel. The fact that Jesus Christ will ultimately defeat Satan. He would defeat sin and death. And then he goes further and he goes into the ark and that he is their only safe refuge. And then as he talks further into Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and how Isaac was offered as a sacrifice that Jesus himself is our ultimate once and for all sacrifice. And he continues into the Exodus and, and he shares how God's people were delivered. That Jesus Christ is our ultimate deliverer. That it is only through Christ that we can be delivered from sin and self. And he goes through and talks about David, the, the great king of Israel. But Jesus himself is our great king, our only high priest. All of scripture no matter where you go. It says he started with Moses. That means he started in Genesis and he went through Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and he talked about Joshua and he went through Judges and he went through Ruth and that he is our kinsman redeemer. He is our redeemer. He went through all of scripture and he went through all the prophets all the while pointing to the fact that he himself is the greater prophet. He used God's word to show these two followers that he, in fact, at this moment had fulfilled the word of God, that he had been resurrected. And notice then that they, after they get to where they're going, first he kind of half mockingly says to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. We so often are just like this. We have God's word and yet we do not know God. We don't spend time in God's word. We allow the world and all the world has to keep us from the word of God rather than the word of God being our God as we face all the world has. So it says they drew near to the village and it notice it said he acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him, which is pretty cool, right? You're, you just walk with a man who literally walked you through the entire Bible. They urged him strongly saying, please stay with us. We're now to the evening. It's near dinner time. It says the day was far spent. But notice Jesus, the gracious, loving Jesus, went and stayed with them. And it says when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to him. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And in that moment, as they recognized him, he vanished from their sight. Jesus, fully God, fully man. He was fully man at this moment. He sat at the table. He broke bread. He ate bread with them. But then his, in his deity, he, he vanishes from their sight. And if you start to go through all the gospel accounts, you'll know that uh, he will go from there. He will appear to the disciples. He appears in the room that they have gathered he just appears. He's God. He can do anything he wants. 
But notice they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? And notice this part, while he opened to us the scriptures. God's word is so precious. Do we treat it as such? When we hear God's word, are, we, do we, are, are, are our hearts aflamed? Peter tells us in 1 Peter that having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, let one another earnestly from a pure, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is from the very mouth of Peter, who was the one who denied Christ three times that afternoon of the crucifixion. He denied even knowing Christ. And yet Jesus will restore him and he will write this beautiful passage. He will write multiple epistles and he will ultimately die himself for his faith in Christ. Jesus Christ is the living expositor. Jesus walked through the Bible, the precious word of God. In Acts 2, we read that let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that Jesus has made, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received what? His word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. God's word will change your life. Period. There's power in God's word. We must be people of his word. Charles Spurgeon further says that we gather together on the first rather than the seventh day of the week because redemption is even a greater work than creation and more worthy of commemoration and because the rest which followed creation is far outdone by the rest which ensues upon the completion of redemption. Like the apostles, we meet on the first day of the week and hope that Jesus may stand in our midst and say, Peace be unto you. Our Lord has lifted the Sabbath from the old and rusty hinges whereon the law had placed it long before and set it on the new golden hinges which his love has fashioned. He has placed our rest day, not at the end of a week of toil, but at the beginning of the rest which remains for the people of God. Every first day of the week we should meditate on the rising of our Lord and seek to enter into the fellowship with him in his risen life. We celebrate a risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice the last thing. Their hearts burn because of the scripture and they rose that same hour and they made that, 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 that seven mile track back to Jerusalem. They could not wait to get back to Jerusalem. And it says they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. In just a, a matter of a few moments from now, we too are going to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, a time that we gather as we break the bread and partake of the cup. Jesus had just instituted the Lord's Supper just a few nights before this event where these two men that were on the road to Emmaus, maybe they were there in that room, we don't know, but 
when he instituted the Lord's Supper. But they recognize Jesus when he reveals himself. You see, when Jesus Christ reveals himself to us by the working of his spirit and his spirit draws us to himself, we are forever changed. We can no longer live the way that we have chosen to live all those years prior. But no, we are changed because of the very presence of Christ. He gives us a new heart, a heart that will desire him, a heart that desires to be with his people, a heart that desires to live for Christ. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ alone? Not by works, not by having the gold star in attendance or having been a church member or having even been baptized, but have you trusted in Jesus Christ by faith alone? Have you surrendered your will to his? And then the very spirit of God, it says, when we come to Jesus by faith, enters us and we are sealed until the day of redemption. And because we are sealed by the spirit, it's nothing that we have done to earn that. There's nothing we can do to unearn that. There's nothing we can do to talk someone into salvation because someone else could talk someone else. It is the complete work of Jesus Christ through the power of his spirit and through the working of his word. His word has power. We want to be people of his word. We want to not only be in the word, but we need the word in us. And, has, and, and your love for God's word will grow the more and more we're in it. By the way, your love for people and God's people will grow more and more when you're in God's word. If God is for us, who can be against us? But surely this morning there are those, and, and you know this morning, have you have truly surrendered your life to Christ, if you have placed your faith in Christ alone. And I would encourage you as strongly and implore you as, as much as I can that maybe today is the day of salvation. If the Spirit of God is drawing you, then I would encourage you to let somebody know you're with today or let one of our elders that will be around here at the close of the service know that God's Spirit is drawing you to Himself. And you may have played church a long time. Folks, you can play church and go to hell. Don't be that person whose pride is what's going to keep you from experiencing an eternity with a loving God. He paid the ultimate price for you and I. We cannot live the way we choose to live any longer when you surrender your life to Christ because you no longer own your life. He purchased it. All those who come to faith, your life has been purchased. So we need to trust and we need to walk with him. It does not mean that your, your life is necessarily going to get easier and we would probably even say that it's possible it might get harder. Because we have an enemy in the world and we have an enemy even in our own flesh that we're going to have a battle within our own hearts at times. But the very spirit of God is going to lead you. He's going to walk with you and guide you and take you through all things. Do not leave here today without having made things right with the Lord. And even as we shortly partake in the Lord's Supper, make sure we are examining our hearts. But I just want to encourage you again. That if God's spirit is drawing you today, don't leave without making rights with God. Make sure today you surrender if God's spirit is leading you. We're going to have a, a time, um, a prayer, and then we're going to have a Lord's Supper shortly thereafter. Father, we come to you this morning so thankful for all that you continually do in our lives. That Father, you refuse to leave us where we are. You have called us to so much more. Father, we thank you for the work that you have done. That, Father, you lived the perfect life. You died the death that we should have died for our sin. You exchanged place with us. You took on our sin and you placed on us your righteousness. Father, Jesus Christ is alive and he is interceding for each and every one here. And even in this moment, we know he is intercede, interceding for, for hearts here to surrender to you. So, Father, we pray this morning that God, by your spirit and through your word, that God, you will draw men, women, and children to yourself. That even this morning, that there'll be someone here that would trust Jesus Christ by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. Father, that's just what the Bible says. So, Father, we thank you that we can gather 
not only this Resurrection Sunday, but, Father, every Sunday and, and every day that we can wake up and know that we have a loving God, that we have a Savior who gave His life. Father, it was not taken, it was freely given. And He fulfilled all that was required that You send Him to do, that He might reconcile us to You. So, Father, we praise You. We thank You for all that You do. And we lift all this in Christ's name. Amen. Before we go into our uh, time of the Lord's Supper, uh, before we do that, we're going to have a, a short uh, prayer time. I'm going to ask if Troy and Jamie would come up, come, come up here for a minute. They're getting ready to uh, head out on a mission trip this coming Wednesday uh, to Philly. And they're going to be working with the Fix Ministries. been working up there for... Uh, quite some time. So I'm just going to ask if anyone's able to kind of just come up. You don't have to everybody, but if you want to, that's cool too. But everybody that's able, just kind of come up and gather around them. Just want to pray for them and that this week they will just see God move in incredible ways, not only through the people they serve, through their own hearts, and just to be, um, just to be overwhelmed by the presence of God. So come on up if you can, and we're just going to pray over them. And then uh, after that, we'll have air time. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the work that you continually do in and through us. And Father, we thank you for Troy and Jamie and their willingness to go uh, up this coming week uh, to Philadelphia to uh, be part of a, a tremendous ministry, God. There's a great work going on there. There's a tremendous work that, uh, that needs to be done there, Father. And there's so many hurting people that are in desperate need of the hope that can be only found in Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray and for every interaction they have uh, throughout this week. I pray as they even travel to and from that, God, you will just place divine appointments in their paths. That, God, they will be able to share the hope that they have that is in Christ Jesus. And no matter what anybody is going through or what they may have been struggling with, it, they will, Father, see that Jesus is the only answer. That, Father, no matter how far they may think they have gone and no matter what they've done, that, Father, there is hope because Jesus died for them. So, Father, we lift them up to you and that we pray for each person here to be continually in prayer this week as they, uh, as they minister in this community. It's a, a tremendous opportunity, Father. So just pray for them, pray for the fix and all those else that they'll be going with, that as they uh, perform and uh, do a medical mission there, that, God, they will uh, not just meet those physical needs, but they are important, God, but that ultimately their, their, their greatest need is in Christ Jesus. So, Father, we pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. It's been a wonderful day, a wonderful morning so far. Uh, and it is uh, always, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but every time I'm up here or doing anything for 